When I was uh, 16 years old, I decided I would surprise my parents. My father, my uh, stepfather, always threatened to sign me up in the military, uh, military school uh, because I was a pretty rebellious child. Um, but I really didn't have a problem with, you know, discipline. My problem was with hypocrisy, you know. So at the age of 16, uh, when I was finishing up my junior year in high school, a Marine Corps recruiter came in and he talked to the juniors about joining the Marine Corps. And at the end of his presentation, I went up to him and I said, how old do you have to be? I said, I'm 16. He says, well, if your parents sign a waiver, you can actually join right now. I'm like, really? He says, you have to finish high school, but you can start attending reserve meetings and work with a uh, combat engineer unit. I said, okay, I'd, I'd like to do that. I gave him my address. I told him to come to my house. And when I got home from school that day, I told my parents, I said, I got a surprise for you today. Six o'clock, somebody's coming to visit. And they said, oh, well, who is it? I said, you'll see at six o'clock. <laughs> and at six o'clock, he was right on time. He knocked on the door, I opened the door, and there stood a Marine Corps sergeant. And uh, they were like, shocked. He asked if he could come in. They invited him in. He sat down at the dining room table with them, and he explained to them the procedure. And he said, all you have to do is sign the papers. And I could see my, my stepdad reaching for the pen before he got the paperwork out. <laughs> and they signed the papers. At the age of 17, when I graduated high school, two weeks later, I went on the boot camp in, in San Diego, California, MCRD. And the, the training is intense. And you meet very, uh, many obstacles in the training field, and that's to prepare you to meet the opposition and uh, deal with it. And one of the training courses they had was called a strength and endurance course. Now, this was a two and a half mile course, and it worked like this. You would run as fast as you could for a quarter mile, you'd do some push-ups. You'd run again for another quarter mile, you'd do pull-ups. You'd run again for another quarter mile, you did sit-ups. You run again for another quarter mile, and you do what we'd call at that time bends and thrust, which today many young people would call that a burpee. And every quarter mile, you're doing something. And I'm so thankful that they put that at the latter part of our training. Because had they put it on the front side, it probably wiped half of us out. So they were really wise in how they schooled us to prepare us for the harder task at hand. And so the easier uh, obstacle courses or the training we had, physical fitness and mental endurance that you would encounter as well, uh, was a little easier on the front side and it built you up for it. And I would say that today we have a similar school, a similar training that God puts us through, but it's called the School of Christ and it's much more efficient and it's much more effective. Because what I like about the school of Christ, God just doesn't focus on the physical and the mental. He focuses on the whole being. Amen? And it's his goal to restore us completely and fully in his image and likeness. And in the school of Christ, we have our own challenges. We have our own trials. We have our own obstacles. We have our own opposition that we will encounter. But the beautiful thing about this school is... When you cannot do for yourself because it's humanly impossible, the Holy Spirit comes down and gives you the power to accomplish it. Amen? That is the beauty of the school of Christ. Today, I want to look at the book of Joshua, and I would like to draw out some lessons for us today in hopes to build our confidence and strength in God, but also prepare us to do a greater work for him. So I invite you to bow your heads as I kneel here and pray. Gracious Father, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you so much for the sweet fellowship we've already had the opportunity to enjoy in song and scripture reading and the children's story and the special music. Lord, thank you for coming down and visiting us today. And you've you said on this day, it's a special day. It's a day you've set aside. And as we gather to honor you, to worship you, 
you have promised to come down and move us closer to your heart in a deeper relationship with you. So today, Father, we ask you to speak and hide me behind the cross. May your voice be heard as we read from inspiration. In Jesus' name, amen. So I invite you to turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Now the Israelites, they had been in the school of Christ for the last 40 years. And I'm sure they've learned many lessons by this time. And their faithful leader has just passed. Moses went up in the mountain with God, and the Lord laid him to rest. But they were to go on into the promised land and press on. And God was going to continue to bring them into situations that would challenge their faith, that would build their confidence and their strength in Him. And in Joshua 1, God lays out some promises and encouragement right away to the leader and to the people. Starting with verse 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord came to pass. It, this, after the death of the, uh, Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass. That the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, minister, uh, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to you, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I have said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all of the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not um, any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. That's a lot of encouragement in just a short period of time for us, as it was for them. Then he goes on to say, Joshua, he's speaking to him directly, be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all of the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand nor to the left, that thou mayest prosper wheresoever thou goes. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou may observe to do according to all that is written therein, for when thou shalt make thy for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt go and have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage? Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. Now I'd like to take note of something here. God did not tell him it was going to be easy. He didn't tell him they were going to be without trial or challenges. He just said, arise and go. And the first obstacle they're going to encounter is the Jordan River. How are they going to get across? They weren't bridge builders. What were they going to do? He told them to go, so they had to go that far in faith before they received any more instruction. You think about the Great Commission that went out to the disciples and has gone out to each and every one of us today. Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore. He didn't say it was going to be easy. He didn't say it was going to be without challenge. He didn't tell exactly how it was all going to work out. He just said, go. And so, Josh would receive these words from God, perhaps in his morning devotion. And I want to encourage everybody here today, if you're not having a morning devotion, if you're not having family worship, I appeal to you to reorganize your life in such a way that it can take place. Because what God gives you in the morning 
may be exactly what you need to face that day's challenges. What God gives you in the morning may be exactly what you need to share to somebody that is in a position of hopelessness or discouragement. What God gives you that day may be what it, the very thing that it takes to keep your family knitted together. So if you're not having morning devotion because your schedule's too busy, I encourage you, it's, it's time to realign our priorities because God speaks to us on a daily basis. Morning by morning, He'll wake our ear to hear, to give us something to speak to them that are weary, to share the good news of the gospel. I know some of our students, you're so busy with your, your studies that it's hard to squeeze in devotional time. I encourage you, squeeze it in. God is able to give you much more and extend your, your, your understanding on your subjects if you put him first. He'll make it work out. He has a way of doing that. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. So I encourage you, spend time with God. You know, God speaks to us through his word, through the Holy Spirit, through providences, through people. And so we need to have that time with them. We need to take time for family worship. We need to have time for prayer meeting and corporate worship as well. So they are prepared through the word of God to go forward. Let's go over to Joshua chapter 3. Because now they're going to encounter their first obstacle before going into the promised land. Joshua chapter 3. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure, Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way hitherto for. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonderful things among you. So they're told to get ready. God's going to do a wonderful work. Friends, I'm appealing to you, get ready. For God's about to do a wonderful work in our day. We will all have a Jordan to cross. We will all have to step out in faith and encounter something that may not be so pleasant. It may be a great challenge to us. It may be something that we've, we've always heard God speaking to us to do, but we've always pushed it away. But God is willing to give us the grace that is needed to accomplish that work. So he told them to go and prepare. In verse 10 it says, And Joshua said, Hereby shall you know that the living God is among you, and that, with, that he without fail drives out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perzites, the Girgashites, and Amorites, and the Jebusites said, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you. Now, this is a beautiful thing because before any trial you will ever encounter in your whole life, Christ has already encountered it, and he's already prepared a way for you and I. And so I want you to imagine being one of those priests having to carry the ark and walk towards that raging river. In verse 13, it says, And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest shall bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand up in a heap. And verse 15, And they that bear the ark would come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priest that bear the ark were dipped into the brim of the waters the Jordan overflowing with his banks all the time of the harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap. I want you to think about this for a moment. Think if you were one of those priests. You're carrying the ark, 
and you're walking towards that raging river, and the closer you get, nothing's happening. And you get to about a foot away, and nothing's happening. Do you think their heart beats up? You think they might be a little anxious? Yeah. I don't know if I'd want to be one of the priests or if I'd want to be one of the Israelites a half a mile back watching what's going to happen. But it would have been an amazing thing to be there that day. And as that priest put his foot forward, and I'm sure they did not hesitate, and he stepped down, and that foot touched the brim, hit the brim of his foot, touched that water. That water stood up. The next foot, the next step he took was on dry ground. Can you imagine the excitement that built in their heart as soon as that happened? I'm sure immediately they began to praise the Lord. And perhaps they were praising the Lord all the way there. Do you think that built their faith? You think it increased their faith? The Israelites coming behind them, do you think they hesitated? Not a bit. They went right on over. It says in verse 17 here, And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people passed clean over Jordan. Now, why do I share this? Because each one of us, every day, perhaps throughout the week, face different obstacles and challenges that are there to develop our character, to build our faith in God, to give us opportunity to draw near to the Lord, perhaps as we've never done before. Now, when we look at what's happening in our world today and within our own church and our institutions, our people are faced with many obstacles. Perhaps it's deciding whether or not you're going to leave your job. Perhaps it's deciding whether you're going to go on a mission trip. Perhaps it's deciding whether you're going to go over and knock on your neighbor's door and encounter them for the first time. Perhaps it's just reconciling a broken relationship. I don't know what challenges you may face personally. But what I do know is we serve a God that does not allow anything come to us that he hasn't already measured and weighed before he permits the trial to come. There's a beautiful promise in the book of 1 Corinthians 10.13. I cut it out and I put it in my Bible at the front. It's a reminder to me. It's one that has brought me great encouragement and strength, especially the commentary that comes with it. And it says this, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There is no temptation taken you but such as common to man. But God is faithful. God is what? Faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. But with the temptation also make a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. Now, here's the commentary from that. This comes from Our High Calling 323. Each one has his own battles to fight, his own Christian experience to gain, independent in some respects from any other soul. And God has lessons for each to gain for himself that no other can gain for him. Now, this part here, I, I encourage you to take special note of. Our Heavenly Father measures and weighs every trial before He permits it to come to the believer. What do you say? You think about this, friends. Now, maybe you're thinking, I don't know how that could be because this last temptation overcame me. Well, He's measured it and He's weighed it before He's permitted to come. She goes on to say, he considers the circumstances and the strength of the one who is to stand under the proving and test of God, and he never permits the temptation to be greater than the capacity of resistance. He never permits the temptation to be greater 
than our capacity to resist. If the soul is overborne, the person overpowered, this can never be charged to God. But the one tempted was not vigilant and prayerful and did not appropriate by faith the provisions God had abundantly in store for him. Christ never fails a believer in his hour of combat. The believer must claim the promise and meet the foe in the name of the Lord. So I don't know, friends, what, what Jordan passages you may have to cross in the coming days. But I want you to remember that verse and the commentary to it, that God is so good that he measures and he weighs things before he permits it to come to you and I. And never will it be greater than our capacity to resist. He takes in consideration our whole life, our education, our experience with him, the past trials, the past victories. Isn't that good news? I don't know about you, but when I think of perhaps some of the things coming down the road, I'm thankful that I serve a God that is able to keep me from falling. So they had the cross, the Jordan. They went over. They went over on dry ground. They sent some spies in to check out Jericho. They came back. They gave a report. God told them to get ready to take the city. He gave them very clear instruction and in how it was to happen. Turn with me to chapter 6. Chapter 6, I'm going to start with verse 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thy hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and all the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. The seven priests shall bear before, before the ark seven trumpets of ram, ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and all the people shall ascend up, every man straight before him. Verse 10. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then shall ye shout. Now think about this, friends. Again, put yourself out there in that army. You're walking around the city. You're tempted to talk to the person next to you, but you are commanded not to say a word. Now, have you ever gone on a walk with somebody? Was it a quiet walk? Somewhere along the walk, you began to talk, right? What if God told you that morning, when you walk with that person, don't say a thing? Would it be easy? Especially somebody that you naturally talk to every day? No, I'd, I'd imagine it'd be quite the challenge. But they had to be in harmony with the command of God in order for God to do what he said he would do. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, preparing in the Marine Corps for battle, um, if, if my commander told me all I need you guys to do is go out there and shout and these walls are going to fall down and we'll be able to get the enemy, I'd have looked at him and said, here's something wrong with you because that's just not going to work. But we're serving a living God that has done great and mighty things for them. They've, been, they've had food provided for them every day in the wilderness, something to drink every day in the wilderness. Their, their sandals did not wax out and wear out. God just opened the Jordan River for them. They crossed over. He promised that he would do this. I would imagine that in the process of walking around that city, 
they were searching their heart. They wanted to make sure they were right with God. They wanted nothing to hinder God from accomplishing the work he said he would do and fulfilling the promise that he said he would carry out. When I was thinking about the harmony that had to take place among those soldiers, the one mind, the one accord, it made me think about what had to take place in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, or proceeding up to Pentecost. The disciples had to come into that room and they had to set aside differences. They had to kneel down and search their own heart and pray and ask God for forgiveness. There was reconciliation that took place. They understood the immense task before them and they knew that it would not be accomplished in their own strength. The Israelites, as they marched around that city, they knew that wall was not going to come down by their strength and their effort. It was going to be something divine that had to take place. And so, friends, just as Israel were facing, facing the various nations that were great and powerful, and the disciples were facing Rome, a nation that was rejecting Christ, Satan himself. It's no different for us today. We're told to go and carry the gospel forward. Jesus did not say it was going to be easy. He did not say we were not going to face loss, hardship, trials, or challenges and persecution. It's all a given. There's a great controversy taking place, friends. But unless we come together and we press together and we humble ourselves and we're willing to forgive and we're willing to treat each other with dignity, respect, and kindness, regardless if we agree, because we're not always, I think, going to agree on everything. That's not what Jesus said would reveal that we are his disciples. He said, by this you'll know they're my disciples. How they what? How they what? Love each other. He didn't say how we agree with each other. I mean, right? But how we love each other. And so God is calling us, friends, to unify. The enemy is gaining ground each and every day, and God wants to pour out his spirit upon his people, but he cannot do it if we're not willing to labor in love, not only for one another, but for lost souls. This comes from, ye shall receive power, page 310. The great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with His glory, will not come until we have an enlightened people that know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. When we have entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of His Spirit without measure. But this will not be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God. God cannot pour out a spirit when selfishness and self-indulgence are so manifest. When a spirit prevails that, if put into words, would express that answer of Cain, am I my brother's keeper? It goes on to say, if the truth for this time, if the signs that are thickening on every hand and that testify that the end of all things is at hand are not sufficient to arouse the sleeping energy of those who profess to know the truth, then darkness proportioned to the light which has been shining will overtake these souls. There is not the semblance of an excuse for their indifference that, will be able to, that they will be able to present to God in the great day of final reckoning. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read Matthew 24, 
It's screaming at me. Because everything that Jesus said would happen before he comes is intensifying throughout our world right now. And you read Psalms 91, and three times it makes reference to pestilence or plague. More than anything else, that is mentioned in Psalms 91. So we can expect that to intensify as we continue to the close of time. And if you read Revelation 13, you'll take note note that the sea beast and the land beast, which we know as the papacy in the United States, begin to work together. And we see that happening quite a bit more now than ever before. We're also told in the great controversy that the Protestant churches will amend themselves with the Roman Catholic Church. And we see that's been happening over the last five to seven years, more so now than ever before. And when you look at the last encyclical that the Pope written back in 2015 in regards to climate change, over and over throughout that encyclical, he's talking about a day of rest, a day of rest, family day, a day of rest. And what day is that, friends? Well, they, they, it's Sunday for them. But what day is the day of rest for God's people? So we got a great controversy getting ready to break forth on the scene before us. So my question to you, brothers and sisters, are we ready to press together? Are we ready to reprioritize our lives? Are we ready to put God first and foremost? Are we ready to consecrate our time, our talent, and our treasure to the cause of God? I was greatly encouraged as I, as I came out for prayer meeting Wednesday night, and there was about 100 people here. Praise the Lord. And I've been greatly encouraged as I sat here this morning and I talked with Mike Jacobson who went out to Montana with us and when he came back, he had a burden on his heart to keep that that small group of laborers in the mission together and start a small group prayer meeting with them and then do door-to-door ministry once a month. Praise the Lord. And I've been greatly encouraged in the past by a lady named Mrs. Miller who was 103 years old still handing out the great controversy Amen? And I've been greatly encouraged as I've seen Lee Tripp, an elder who's passed away, come here night after night for an evangelistic meeting, even after having a stroke, not giving up. He wanted to be among God's people. He knew he could perhaps not do much, but he could pray. He could not hardly talk, but he could pray in his mind and move the work forward in prayer. I was greatly encouraged when my wife and I were doing Bible work out in Oregon, I got a phone call from a lady who was on hospice. She was dying from cancer. And she said, uh, Dennis, I would like you and your wife to come over and do Bible studies with my caregivers. She says, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have much longer to live, but I want them to know Christ. And they're willing to, to study. She had been witnessing to him for the last couple of months. So we'd go over there every Thursday and we would, we would minister to three different caregivers. And I remember my wife saying, honey, and my wife's got got this this real burden on her heart. She says, let's take her some flowers in a cart now while she can still smell them, while she can still see them. Friends, when you know somebody that that is struggling with life, let's not bring the flowers to the the funeral service. Let's take them in advance, amen? Then be creative and think about how you can minister to that precious soul in those closing hours to give them hope, give them courage. And that following Sabbath, what we did is we came up front. I got the whole church to come up front because she was, she was one of those people that everybody knew in the church. And it was a smaller church. So we got the whole church to come up front and we sang the song when we all get to heaven and we recorded it. And we took it to her the next Thursday and we played it for her. The following week... That morning, she told her caregivers, get, get my mouth swabbed out. She hadn't been eating for a couple of days or drinking any water. She said, but get me ready for Bible study. She had her bed set up in the living room and uh, so she could at least hear. She didn't want to share anything. She just wanted to be able to hear the Bible study going on. And we came and she was sleeping. And uh, we finished our Bible study and I got a call later that day that she had passed. 
Now, this is a marvelous thing. I want you to think about this. This woman woke up that morning to go to a Bible study. And she fell asleep. Now, when she wakes up, she's going to wake up thinking she's going to be in her living room for a Bible study. And she's going to be getting in a Bible study, all right. She's going to see Jesus coming in clouds with all the holy angels. What an amazing event that will be. Three of those caregivers were baptized. Praise the Lord. She'll, by the grace of God, see him under the tree of life. I think of Mrs. Jones, who would come every Sabbath faithfully when I was in federal prison and minister to me. Week after week, she would come with a few other saints. Week after week, she was faithful. And you know, she had two sons that were out in the world doing drugs, living corruptly. And she knew that as much as she, she tried to convince them to give their life to God, they wouldn't listen to mom. So she resorted to just praying for them. She would still share with them, but she, she knew that prayer was the key to the victory in their lives. But while she was praying, friends, she was ministering to other people. How many of you have family members? A brother, a sister, a mother, a father. Maybe it's a coworker, or a dear friend. How many of you have somebody that, in your sphere of influence that you've witnessed to that is not responding to Christ, but you're praying for them? How many of you have that in your life today? Well, I want to encourage you, while you're praying for them, start laboring for somebody else's child. Start laboring for somebody else's parent. Start laboring for another coworker. Because while you're doing that, God is organizing things to answer your prayers. I would wind up getting a call from Mrs. Jones inviting me to come and speak at her church. And before I could make it up there, one Sabbath she was up front and she was praying and she had an aneurysm. And two days later she passed. That very day, unbeknown to the police, they came to knock at her door to let her know they found one of her sons dead in the cemetery. It was a very heartbreaking day for the family. I would eventually go up and speak at that church, and the father would bring the other son. And I would share my personal experience and my testimony of God's power in my personal life and what he did for me he can do for anybody else that was willing to let God work. And at the end of the service, he came up to me and I, I shared a book, I shared a couple books with him and I prayed with him and we went our separate ways. It was about a year, maybe a year and a half later, I got a phone call and I answered the phone and the gentleman said, this is Mark Jones. I said, well, greetings, Mark. How are you? I'm doing fine. Okay. Now, I've met a lot of people up to that time in my life and, uh, you know, I get phone calls all the time from people I've, I've met across the world and I said, what can I do for you, Mark? He says, well, you probably don't remember me. I said, I don't, Mark, I'm sorry. And he says, my mother used to come and visit you in the federal prison. Oh, yes, I remember her. I said, how are you doing, Mark? Now I remember. And he said, you know, after you left, several things transpired over the next couple of weeks. He said, I finally gave my life to Christ. He said, I'm an elder in my church. I've consecrated my business to God. What an amazing day that will be under the tree of life as myself and many others, by the grace of God, will be greet Mrs. Jones and thank her for laboring for our souls. And then we're going to say to her, we have a special gift for you. And as we part, and she beholds the face of her sons, what an amazing thing that will be. Friends, it's time that we gather together, that we press together, that we unify, and we begin to labor for souls. Now, every night or every Wednesday, we meet here for prayer meeting. I want to encourage you to think about how you can reprioritize your schedule and be here for prayer meeting. Because it's in this prayer meeting that we begin to pray for individuals, families, our church, our leaders, and situations that are taking place. And as we're praying and pressing together, the God of heaven sees that his spirit is coming down and he's setting in operation influences to move the work forward and to touch people's lives. But if we're too indifferent 
to gathering together and pressing together, then we cannot expect the Spirit to come. But it's time, friends. The enemy is gaining ground. Look at the signs of the times. Look at what's happening in our world. Look at how Bible prophecy is lining up. When I was working on the roof last week, a gentleman said to me, he says, you know, Dennis, I'm, I realize things are happening and things are intensifying. He says, you know, I've been looking at my 401k and I realize that I, I can retire now with Without any problem. And he made a decision that he's going to quit teaching and he's going to retire and he's going to focus on the work of God. Now, the Spirit of God spoke to him. Now, I don't know where God is speaking to any of you today or those listening online, but this I know God is calling his people to arise up for his glory is come to impart light and grace and power to every believing soul to move this work forward. But there are things that hinder it. In closing, I'd like to take a quick look at the story of Achan. They were told not to take any of the things out of Jericho. On verse 19 in chapter 6, it says, But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. If they were to take anything, it would become an accursed thing to them. Achan would go and he would see a Babylonian garment, some uh, shekels of silver and a golden wedge, and he would take it and he would hide it under his tent. The Israelites were confident that God was working in their behalf and they would go on after conquering Jericho to Ai. And they wouldn't send a large army, they'd just send a smaller army out to Ai. And to their dismay, they were turned aside and 36 men died in that battle. Joshua would come back, he'd throw himself on the ground and he'd, he'd pray before God and God would tell him, get up off your face for Israel has sinned. And God would explain to them very clearly in verse 13, he says, up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel, and thou cannot stand before thy enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Now, friends, when the disciples were in the upper room, they were searching their heart. They were surrendering any idols, any bitterness, any resentment they had against a brother or a sister. They were giving it all to Christ and they were asking for forgiveness. Now we're living in a time that God is calling us to go home and search our hearts and pray, is there an accursed thing in our home? Are there things in our home that we watch, we play, we read that promote the attributes of Satan? I want you to think about this, friends. Because if there is, we cannot stand against our enemy because there's an accursed thing in our presence. We must be willing to search our heart and set aside the sins that may be so be easily beset us and give way for the Holy Spirit to work. Patriarchs and prophets, closing quote here, Achan's sin brought disaster upon the whole nation. For one man's sin, the displeasure of God will rest upon his church till the transgression is searched out and put away. The influence most to be feared by the church is not that of open oppressors, infidels, and blasphemers, but of an inconsistent professors of Christ. These are the ones that keep back the blessing of God of Israel and bring weakness upon his people. When the church is in difficulty, when coldness and spiritual declension exist, given occasion for the enemies of God to triumph, then instead of folding their hands and lamenting their unhappy state, let its members inquire if there is an Achan in the camp. Now that doesn't mean we start looking around at each other, trying to figure out who is the worst sinner among us. It doesn't mean we start calling people out and telling them you're the fault that our trouble, 
that this trouble is coming to our church. It's because of you that division is happening. No. She goes on to say, with humiliation and searching of heart, let each seek to discover the hidden sins that shut out God's presence. It's a work that we are to do individually to make sure we're not the ache in, in the camp so that God's work can progress and go forward. So I have a question. Are you having morning devotions? Are you having family devotion? Are you really seeking to organize your schedule so that you can be here for prayer meeting? Are you willing to give a Bible study? Are you willing to consecrate an hour, maybe two hours a week out of your schedule for God's cause? I mean, friends, things are happening. There's people out there that want to know the truth. There's people out there to be studied with. I can tell you this. I've never in my life since I've known Christ had a problem getting a Bible study. I would kneel down and I would tell Lord, Lord, if I don't have a Bible study, I'll kneel down and tell the Lord, Lord, my spiritual life depends on this. I need somebody to study with. Now I know education can keep us busy in our schooling and our studies, but we need to find time and make time to put God's work first. If you're going to school and you're studying something just about, it's all about the money, well, then you're in the wrong place. Because our education that brings us into a vocation is just a means to the end to reach somebody for Jesus Christ. And so maybe God is moving you to a different vocation. Maybe God's moving you to a different neighborhood. Maybe God's moving you to do something you've never done before. Maybe go on a mission trip. I don't know what it is. But if you're not having that family worship and you're not raising your kids up to know Christ and know his word and give an account for the faith that they are to believe in, then what will happen when the day will come and a knock takes place on your door and you are separated from your children? Will they stay faithful to God? Where are our priorities, friends? It's time that we rise up and we take a hold of this work and we move it forward in the love of Christ. That we get by our differences, that we love, respect, and treat each other with dignity and kindness, and we rise up for Christ. So on the way out, I have a couple sign-up sheets. If you'd like to give Bible studies, you can sign up, put your number there, phone number there. And as we get requests, you'll get a phone call. If you're willing to go and visit with somebody and pray with somebody, whether it's a member, a sick member, or a, a member that's struggling, or a new person in the community that we have encountered through door-to-door -door ministry, if you're willing to take some time and go and pray with somebody, put your name there and put your phone number. And as things progress, as God continues to open the work, I have faith that he will. As he sees his people rise up for the occasion, he'll open up doors. We'll give you a call. How many are willing to do that? Would you raise your hand? It's just one hour a week. It's not much. I'm sure we can work it out. I want you to think about this. 500 active members coming every week. 500 hours in the community doing Bible study and visiting and praying with people? Do you know what it would do to this community and the communities around us? It would transform them. We would see God work in amazing ways. Friends, let God build our confidence and strength each day as we put more and more trust in Him.